NGOs, development agencies and the world's most richest people always tell us that poverty is a technical problem, one that can be solved by countries adopting the right policies or working harder or following in the footsteps of rich nations. They say that these countries are just lazy, they blame poverty on famines and disease and they say that these governments are weak and corrupt. They say if only these countries were to adopt the policies of Western agencies, they would leave poverty behind and close the gap between the rich and the poor. In order to maintain this narrative, Western powers have consistently used statistical manipulation, whereby the standard by which poverty and inequality are measured is lowered over time to make it look like poverty and inequality are declining, even though they've actually been increasing. So in last week's video I talked about how colonialism, coups and capitalism created the great global divide between rich and poor countries and in this video I want to talk about how debt, resource extraction and free trade and the logic of capitalism have created and continue to maintain poverty today. And I also want to talk a bit about how the mainstream narrative around what causes poverty are mainly myths that are intended to maintain the status quo. How we frame the problem of poverty is so important because the solutions that we come up with directly relate to how we understand the problem. And I think it's more important than ever for us to talk about this now because the same policies and strategies that I talk about in this video that have been used against poor countries to keep them in a state of poverty are also being used at home in rich countries today in the wake of the COVID crisis. This pandemic is basically the perfect opportunity for corporations to come in and take over and make and consolidate more and more money into rich people's hands whilst the rest of us suffer. It's no longer a problem that's just out there abroad far away from us that we don't have to worry about. It's something that's being used at home that's going to impact all of our lives as well. One thing I find incredibly shocking every time that I think about it is the fact that after the colonial era, newly independent states actually had to pay a colonial debt to the nations that colonized them, many of which still have to pay this off today. And it makes absolutely no sense to me that colonized countries have to pay for the amount of suffering and the millions of people that were killed at the hands of the colonizers. And this is a huge reason why poverty and inequality still persist today. And during the 1960s and 70s, the global south was slowly rising and continuing to push for economic justice. And Western powers got scared, fearing that they may be controlled. They started to use aid as an instrument of control through policies called structural adjustment policies, known shorthand as SAPs. SAPs were conceived under the Reagan administration in the 1980s and were sold as conditions to help the global south develop. But in reality, their purpose was just to give Western powers a means by which they could control the global south without the need of brutal interventions. And surprise, surprise, they usually targeted countries with oil or some other natural resource that they wanted to exploit. These initiatives are always spun as an act of Western altruism, but they never bother to explain the fact that SAPs mean that these countries are forced to adopt certain conditions that are imposed on them by the IMF otherwise known as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, which basically ensure the suffering and continued impoverishment of billions upon billions of people. One condition of SAPS is extensive privatization programs. By requiring the global south to privatize public assets, the World Bank and IMF creates opportunities for foreign companies to buy up telecoms, railroads, banks, hospitals, schools, and every conceivable public utility at a huge discount, and either run them for private gain or strip them down and sell them off for profit. This raises the price of key social services like healthcare and education out of reach of the poor. Hospitals and clinics fall apart, leading to a resurgence in infectious diseases, including tuberculosis, malaria, and cholera, 
and hundreds of millions of children have been denied the right to primary education and countries are forced to cut spending on subsidies for services like agriculture, railways and food industries which meant farmers no longer had access to affordable inputs like seeds and equipment and mass famines erupted. So instead of countries being able to invest in schools, healthcare and social development, the savings gleaned from spending cuts and the proceeds of privatisation is then funneled back to Wall Street to repay debts. So billions, even trillions of dollars that's supposed to go to public services and social spending is funneled back to the richest bankers in the West. A second condition of the SAPs is forcing them to deregulate their economies and this basically means that anything at all that can be construed as an obstacle to Western corporations doing trade within these countries has to be completely removed. And this includes labour regulations, environmental regulations, which have led to the displacement of millions of people as a result of deforestation and the destruction of the natural environment. Industries extracting resources in developing countries are also able to stop paying taxes in host countries and at home. Deregulation also means that poor countries are forced to open their markets so that corporations can basically do whatever they want. What this means in reality is that foreign industries come into a country, they dump their own products onto the local market, they force local industries out of the market and out of business. It also prizes open the markets of poor countries so multinational firms can come in and access much cheaper labour which often targets children and since companies can move to another country as soon as their existing contracts no longer give them sufficient funds or workers become too demanding they can force down factory prices playing suppliers off against each other in their insatiable demand for lower costs and higher profits. Poor countries basically have to constantly compete against each other to drive down wages and it's become a global race to the bottom with ever lower working standards and ever lower wages. So all of the cooperation and solidarity that marked the rise of the global south in the 60s was suddenly replaced with cutthroat competition. All of the public companies, whether they had to do with investing in agriculture or whether they were public telephone companies or public whatever, roads companies or all of that, or nearly all, has had to be privatized. So there again, you get an opportunity for private companies to extract wealth. The, the World Bank used to publish, maybe it still does, but all through the 80s and the early 90s, every year it published in microscopic print long lists of companies that had been privatized in its member countries under structural adjustment programs. And every year, uh, I counted them approximately. It was sort of 13 to 1,500 companies a year. Um, they were sometimes bought by local elites. They were often, particularly the larger ones, bought by our own transnational corporations. A third condition of the SAPs was forcing these countries to orient their economies to export certain natural resources such as cotton, coffee and nuts. The problem with this is that Western powers often tell these poor countries to sell the same natural resources, which often means that they have to compete against each other to try and sell the same resource. And naturally, this means that the price of the product that they are selling drops. And obviously, this benefits Western powers. You can then buy up so many of these resources at incredibly cheap prices. Meanwhile, developing countries are forced to export more and more, but the money they get for exports collapses because of so much more availability. So they then, of course, have to export even more to make up for the losses. But of course, the more that they produce, the more the market becomes flooded and prices drop even more. So it's a vicious cycle. And when there's such a large exit of money and goods, currencies collapse. Often rich countries make this even worse by then dumping the same product onto the global market for a lower price, which undercuts the markets of poor countries, undermining their sectors altogether. 
At the same time, rich countries would sell products that poor countries were unable to process themselves back to the poor countries at a disproportionately high price. So poor countries would lose money because they'd have to export commodities at a cheaper rate than the imported finished products. And this is simply a continuation of the colonial model that I talked about in my last video, where they buy cheaper and sell dearer. A fourth strategy implemented by the SAPs is to give poor countries aid in exchange for them siding with the West against other poor countries. And it's basically a clever strategy to prevent cooperation and solidarity between poor nations. Naturally, a lot of these conditions led to social unrest and upheaval, but as soon as things get messy, corporations can move to another country instead. And the fact that these investors can pull money out of poor countries at any moment leaves finance dangerously unstable and unpredictable. And the debt system itself ensures that a river of wealth is flowing from the poor countries to the rich. And because of interest rates, no matter how hard poor countries try to repay their debts, they're only ever chipping away at an ever-growing mountain of compound interest. So many poor countries never even wanted SAPs in the first place because they could see through them and recognize them for what they were. But economic hitmen trained to manipulate and use violence such as coups and military invasion to force them to adopt these policies against their will. The CIA has been directly involved in overthrowing democratically elected leaders in countries like Iran, Iraq, Panama, Chile, Ecuador, Venezuela. We will identify a country, usually a developing country, that has resources we, we covet, our corporations covet, like oil. And then we arrange a, a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. Now, most everybody in, the, in, in, in our country believes that that loan is going to help poor people. It isn't. Most of the money never goes to the country. In fact, it goes to our own corporations. It goes to the Bechtels and the Halliburtons and the ones we all hear about, usually led by engineering firms, but a lot of other companies are brought in. And they make fortunes off building big infrastructure projects in that country. Uh, power plants, industrial parks, uh, ports, those types of things. The country is left holding this huge debt that it can't possibly repay. So at some point, we economic hitmen go back in and we say, you know, you can't pay your debts. You owe us a pound of flesh. You owe us a big favor. So sell your oil real cheap to our oil companies or vote with us on the next critical United Nations vote or send troops in support of ours to someplace in the world. If we don't like what a democratically elected leader of another country is doing, for example, opposing uh, the exploitation of oil in his country, Someone who looks like me will walk into that president's office. I had the job at one time. Walks into the office and says, and now I just want to remind you that I can make you and your family very, very rich if you play my game, our game. Or I can see to it that you're thrown out of office or assassinated if you decide to fulfill your campaign promises. And usually it's said a little more subtly than that because there may be a tape recorder listening. But they get the message because every one of those presidents knows what happened to Arbenz of Guatemala and Allende of Chile and Roldos of Ecuador and Lumumba of the Congo and, and Torrijos and on and on. The list is, is very long of presidents that we have had thrown out or assassinated. We did the same thing in Iraq under Qasim who was a very popular president of Iraq and decided that he uh, wanted to get more of the profits from Iraqi oil to go to the Iraqi people, not to the foreign companies. So we decided he had to go, he had to be assassinated. We sent an assassination team in the early 60s. It was headed by a young man at the time who failed uh, and got, got, got wounded in the process and had to flee the country. That was Saddam Hussein. He was our hired assassin. He failed, so the CIA went in directly and had uh, Qasim publicly executed on Iraqi television and put Saddam's family in power. On the very few instances when neither the economic hitmen nor the jackals are successful, then and only then do we send in the military. And this is what happened in, in Iraq. You know, we, 
The economic hitmen were unable to bring Saddam Hussein around. The jackals were unable to take him out. He had very loyal guards, and he had look-alike doubles, so it was difficult to take him out. And so we sent in the military. So basically, the purpose of all the strategies of the SAPs was to make the markets of poor countries more suitable for exploitation of corporations and foreign industries and to keep the global south indebted to the rich countries and keep them dependent on Western superpowers. And the brilliance of these SAPs is that they seem voluntary. It seems like the poor countries actively wanted to accept these programs to relieve their debt. It operates as a new form of colonialism and imperialism, keeping these countries in perpetual debt, slaves to the Western world. We analyse d'abord de par ses origines. Les origines de la dette remontent aux origines du colonialisme. Ceux qui nous ont prêté de l'argent, ce sont ceux-là qui nous ont colonisés. Ce sont les mêmes qui géraient nos états et nos économies. Ce sont les colonisateurs qui endettaient l'Afrique auprès des bailleurs de fonds, leurs frères et cousins. Nous étions étrangers à cette dette. Ils ne pouvons donc pas la payer. La dette, c'est encore le néocolonialisme où les colonisateurs se sont transformés en assistants techniques. En fait, nous devrions dire qu'ils se sont transformés en assassins techniques. Nous sommes endettés pour 50 ans, 60 ans, même plus. C'est-à-dire que l'on nous a amenés à compromettre nos peuples pendant 50 ans et plus. Mais la dette, c'est sa forme actuelle. Contrôlé, dominé par l'impérialisme. Une reconquête savamment organisée. Pour que l'Afrique. And of course, he was mysteriously killed off just three months after giving this speech. The problem is, it is a slavery that appears invisible because elected officials appear to have the power when in fact most of the power has shifted abroad. This means that even though there were many uprisings and so-called IMF riots that swept the global south in waves, they had little effect because the targets of the rioters were in the west, remote and unreachable, insulated from the cries of the displaced farmers, starving masses and workers on the streets. The impact on poor countries is absolute devastation. They spend more on debt repayment than on health, education, and actually developing and fixing economies. They spend more money paying off interest to debt than on actual debt itself. Incomes collapsed. The number of Africans living in extreme poverty has more than doubled. Economies shrank. Millions of people were dispossessed. Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the poorest part of the world, is paying $25,000 every minute to northern creditors. If you look at the flows of money from north to south and then from south to north, what you find is that the south is financing the north to the tune of about $200 billion every year. El único que puede contratar créditos con los organismos internacionales es el Estado boliviano, es el Estado. Por consecuencia, el Estado cuando contrata créditos bien o mal utilizados, ¿quién los paga? No es el gobierno boliviano, se lo, lo, paga, lo pagan los, los, los ciudadanos bolivianos con sus impuestos. En un momento dado había que cada niño que estaba naciendo ya estaba... <risa> ya, ya, ya estaba, con, un, ya estaba con, un, con, una, con una porción importante a report from UNICEF about the living conditions in Africa states that as many as 5 million children and vulnerable adults may have lost their lives in this blighted continent as a result of the debt crunch. SAPs turned out to be the greatest cause of impoverishment in the 20th century. The number of people living on less than $5 a day increased by 1 billion between the 1980s and 1990s. Instead of helping poor countries, SAPs actively destroyed them.
It's a form of economic genocide as millions die at the hands of these policies and most of the global south has been turned into reserves of cheap labour and natural resources for rich countries. Saabs significantly contributed to the most recent famines in Somalia, the genocide in Rwanda, the civil war in Yugoslavia, the military coup in Bangladesh and the development of the illegal drug economy in Bolivia. A former employee wrote to the managing director of the IMF and said, Dear Mr. Kemdesis, Today I resigned from the staff of the International Monetary Fund after over 12 years and 1,000 days of official fund work in the field, hawking your medicines and your bag of tricks to governments and to people in Latin America and the Caribbean and Africa. To me, resignation is a priceless liberation, for with it I have taken the first step to that place where I may hope to wash my hands of what in my mind's eye is the blood of millions of poor and starving peoples. Mr. Camdesis, the blood is so much, you know. It runs in rivers. It dries up too. It cakes all over me. Sometimes I feel there is not enough soap in the whole world to cleanse me from the things that I did in your name, and in the names of your predecessors, and under your official seal. Any reforms of the IMF, of SAPS, or the World Bank will do nothing to change its essential function. At the same time as SAPs were being used all across the global south, in the 1990s the World Trade Organization was introduced as another tactic to keep poor countries in a state of subordination. The World Trade Organization, otherwise known as the WTO, deals with the global rules of trade between countries. The power of the WTO is distributed according to the market size of each country, which means rich countries' Western powers have most of the control and most of the bargaining power, which means it mostly operates on behalf of corporate interests. A minority profit whilst billions suffer. This plays out in several ways. Just like the SAPs, the WTO forces poor countries to open up their markets for foreign industries to be able to access them as much as they want and they do this by threatening to impose heavy sanctions on poor countries if they fail to comply. Corporations are even allowed to sue states for domestic laws that limit their expected profits, even if the laws are meant to protect human rights, public health or the environment. Even when lawsuits are not filed, the mere threat of them can make elected lawmakers think twice before enacting new regulations. So they essentially punish countries for prioritising the environment or labour regulations over corporate interests. And the sanctions that they impose are often so severe that they end up hindering environmental, labour, pro-social policies. Countries were basically forced to abolish minimum wages, cut taxes, cut wages, slash regulations, relax all restrictions to corporations, press for zero taxation and cut all tariffs in order to survive. And perhaps worst of all, these states aren't allowed to sue the World Bank or IMF or any foreign investors for any of the damages they do. It's so hard to fathom the fact that these private, undemocratic institutions are completely protected from lawsuits, whilst on the other hand, these democratically elected sovereign states can be sued by private entities. And the court hearings where decisions are made over who gets sued and who does not are also completely undemocratically run, conducted in secret tribunals for the benefit of Western powers. To this day, no one has successfully challenged this immunity at all. In El Salvador, for example, citizens voted to ban a gold mine planned by Pacific Rim, a Canadian corporation, because it threatened to destroy part of the country's river system, Pacific Rim is now suing El Salvador for $15 million for potential lost profits. And to me, one of the most disturbing elements of the WTO is that it allows corporations and countries to impose patents and copyright rules. Patents are there to protect your invention and it's basically used to sue anyone who makes, uses or imports your patent without your permission.
As a result of patenting laws, poor countries have to pay an additional $60 billion per year to multinational companies. But it isn't just about the financial cost, it can also have devastating environmental and human costs as well. For example, pharmaceutical companies patented the AIDS cure, locking the price at $15,000 per year. Developing countries couldn't produce generic versions of this medicine and sell it for a fraction of the cost. This meant that firms capable of producing and exporting and selling them cheap enough to save millions were prevented from doing so. 10 million died in Africa of AIDS that would have lived if they had access to this medicine. The same thing has happened with malaria, tuberculosis and other drugs essential for saving lives. 8 million people die each year because of preventable diseases, in large part because they lack access to affordable medicine. They essentially sign a death warrant on millions of people. The only justification the pharmaceutical companies have is that they want to make a profit. They want to gain huge amounts of wealth. Another example is companies like Monsanto patenting seeds. They literally patent something that is vital to survival, giving them unprecedented control over food production. And this has led to thousands upon thousands of suicides from farmers who are basically forced into a form of slavery working for these companies. Food is a weapon. They said when you sell real weapons and arms, you control armies. When you control food, you control society. When you control seed, you control life on Earth. And if this all isn't bad enough, it's horrifying to think about the fact that since the WTO, so many more trade deals, laws and policies have been put in place to give even more power to these corporations. And it's so debilitating as well to think about the fact that the WTO is controlled by Western powers, which means the transnational capitalist class control the discourse around debates on the global economy, so they're rarely ever challenged on their practices. So the largest and most powerful economies, Western powers, almost always get their way. Given all of this, it's easy to see that the real purpose of the WTO was never to make trading more equal. Trade is war and there is a war being waged by rich countries against the poor. It's basically equivalent to a corporate coup on a global scale. Once it became more difficult to directly intervene in these countries, they had to find indirect means of doing this, and the WTO was the answer. Just like in the colonial period, poor countries' integration into the global economy continues to be characterized by the exploitation of natural resources and labor. And by pitting countries against each other, the WTO and SABs have succeeded at undermining global solidarity and cooperation. It's a strategy as old as colonialism, divide and conquer. While SABs imposed these policies on poor countries one by one, the WTO standardized the system across all poor countries. Once again, any reforms are not going to change its essential function. Resource extraction is a key element of 21st century imperialism. Extracting resources that benefit a relatively small group of people at the expense of the vast majority of humanity. In 2007, there was a devastating world food crisis that meant starvation for millions of people. The mainstream narrative was that this was a natural phenomenon, but this was a complete and utter lie. There was nothing natural about any of this. It was a direct result of all the things that I talked about in this video and my previous video. And if this isn't bad enough, corporations and foreign investors use this food crisis as an opportunity to buy up millions of acres of land in poor countries in order to ship food and other products back to the West to make a profit. Many of these purchases were land grabs. It's difficult to know how much land was grabbed because of the secrecy of the transaction, but it's somewhere between 120 to 560 million. Since 2000, the value of land has been 97 billion, and that's just a one-year lease value. And with climate change, the share of losses felt by poor countries will increase by 92% by 2030. And this is just the financial cost. The environmental cost of this is also catastrophic. 
They displace and destroy the livelihoods of millions of people. They lose their homes, their resources, their livelihoods, their communities. And this is only a tip of the iceberg of the money that can be made from this land by these rich investors and corporations. They managed to get away with this because they promised to use the land for poverty alleviation or climate change mitigation purposes if these countries then promise to cut regulations, cut taxes, make it easier for these corporations and agribusinesses to operate within these countries. This consolidates huge amounts of money into corporate hands, whilst the regions gain barely any revenue from this land, and most of the resources and food that is made on this land is exported abroad. It's basically another form of colonialism. Once again, when direct colonization was much harder to do, they had to use indirect coercive means in order to access this land. But of course, it isn't just through indirect means that this is done. The willingness of Western powers to pursue their natural resource interests through military force is aptly seen by internal US and UK government documents which showed that the Iraq war was fought to secure access to that country's vast oil reserves. Direct conflict with resource extractive industries is a daily reality for millions of people all across the globe. One of the main solutions that people always come up with whenever you talk about poverty and inequality is to increase the flow of aid to poor countries. Poverty is not a political question, it's a matter of aid. It allows rich countries to not take any responsibility at all for what they do to create poverty abroad, when in reality, the net outflow of debt is 24 times larger than the amount of money poor countries get in income, including aid. This means that for every school that is built, for every well dug or food package sent, the bosses and banks of the West receive 24 times that amount back. It is not rich countries that are developing poor countries, it is poor countries that are developing rich countries, and they have been doing this since the late 15th century. I want to make a video all about aid and philanthropy in the future, but for now my main point is that although aid can be positive in the short term, in the long term it just maintains and reproduces the status quo and doesn't tackle any of the root problems that are causing poverty and inequality. And so many people say that the reason for poverty and inequality and the reason why aid doesn't work is because of corrupt leaders. And this fits nicely with our cliched image of African dictators and bribery in India. But when you look at the numbers, only 3% of total illicit flows are as a result of corrupt leaders, whereas 65% of the money that comes out of poor countries in total illicit flows is as a result of corporate tax evasion from transnational corporations. And then what about the corruption of the WTO and the IMF and World Bank and SAPS and everything that I've talked about today? It's pretty convenient that the mainstream definition of corruption doesn't encompass any of them. All of the myths that I've talked about today about the ways in which we're taught to think about poverty simply exist to maintain the status quo, to keep a veil over our eyes. The truth is that poor countries, for the most part, are not responsible for their poverty. It is that they're actively being prevented from being able to alleviate themselves from poverty. That being said, the solution is not simply to reform the WTO, the IMF, the World Bank. Most reforms have been granted to us as a form of strategic philanthropy, a way to manage reputations, detoxify images of corporations, fight off the threat of external regulation, depoliticize the situation, manufacture amnesia, masking corporate malpractice. It's just a PR exercise to make them look like they care and are doing something. The underlying policies remain exactly the same. They continue even though they're failing because they're not failing at their actual objectives. They want to prevent revolutions in poor countries. They want to re-establish access to natural resources and markets and make sure that global capitalism does not collapse. And even if we were to get rid of one of these institutions, another one would simply pop up to take its place. 
We need to tackle this problem at its root and the root cause of this is global capitalism. The pressure to make more and more money to continue to make capitalism work translates into more debt, more free trade, more resource extraction as the system drives around trying to find new ways to survive. In Africa, it may come in the form of land grabs, in Greece, in the form of debt crisis, in the US, in the form of privatization of public services, in Iraq, in war, in Brazil, deforestation, in Canada, the fracking of the tar sands. Around the world, it means longer, horrendous working conditions, higher costs of living, automation, environmental destruction, and perhaps worst of all, climate change. We know that capitalism continuously bumps into limits to the creation of new profits and one of the ways in which it deals with this is opening up new markets, new consumer markets, new labour markets, new resource markets. And this is where Stabs and the WTO and resource extraction abroad comes in. It basically enables new forms of foreign investment extraction profits with high amounts of money basically guaranteed, which helps to prevent a crisis temporarily and helps capitalism to continue on as usual. It's not a real solution to the crisis of capitalism, it's just a way of moving the crisis around geographically. So it's not the rich people, the people causing the problem that feel the effects. And following the financial crash of 2008, countries in the EU have suffered as a result of spiraling debt, forced to borrow huge amounts of money to counter the failure of the banking system. Countries have been required to impose horrific public spending cuts on their people, rapidly increasing the number of people living in desperate poverty in Europe. And as capitalism bumps into more and more crises, like the COVID pandemic, like climate change for example, it's likely that the situation will get even worse. It's likely that rich corporations are going to seize the opportunity of the COVID crisis to come into not only poor countries but also rich countries and consolidate more and more power and money for themselves whilst the rest of us suffer. And some people argue that because some formerly poor countries have managed to work their way up and become richer over time, that this means that things will get so much better globally. But in reality, this has just created a new wave of imperialism from the emerging economies themselves. Capital from countries of former poor countries can pose just as grave a threat to labour, local communities and the environment as capital originating from Western powers. As a Chinese participant of the World Social Forum aptly said, do not expect capital to act any differently just because it has a Chinese face. It's really important for me to say as well, if I haven't made it clear already, all of these strategies are still being used today. SAPs are still widely used. Over intervention is still happening like in Libya and Iraq. Direct coups are still happening, especially in Latin America, and assassinations are also commonplace. And our governments help to keep the system in place, as the dividing line between corporate and political representatives is blurred to the point of non-existence, as the revolving door between business, government and other public institutions ensures that key officials are fully embedded with the capitalist elite. And the increasing concentration and centralization of incomes and wealth within a capitalist class means that it can exercise disproportionate influence and control over the media and therefore public opinion. Most universities are run as corporations and are just apologists for the system. And these institutions conveniently valorize the rich, the billionaires as our heroes. They feed us lies about the causes of poverty. We need to free our minds from this mental bondage. We can't rely on these institutions for creating change. We must agitate, organize, educate. We must go into communities and help in whatever way we can. We must give food, give shelter, give whatever we can to help as many people as we can. I think that this pandemic is one of the best opportunities that we will ever have in our lifetimes for us to come together and create mass change. I'm going to leave a link to lots of different resources on how we can get organized during this COVID pandemic in the description box below.
As Edmund Burke said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. It's our choice. Are we going to leave capitalism to its own devices as it creates an ever larger plurocratic and oligarchic class structure where the rest of us are left to hustle a living or starve to death? We've come to a point in history where the question is no longer about whether we will allow poverty to exist, but it's about the very existence of humanity and our planet. As always, I've only touched on the tip of the iceberg of all the things that I could have discussed in this video, so I definitely want to make future videos about war, mass incarceration, climate change, philanthropy, but I want to say thank you so so much for watching all the way to the end, and these videos take so long to make and so much energy to record, so I would really appreciate if anyone could spare just a dollar or two a month and consider supporting me on Patreon. I also would love it if you could go and check out James's channel who has kindly edited this video for me and also has a YouTube channel. I will link that down below. Thank you so much for watching.